Hey, welcome back to the Petapixel Podcast. I'm Chris Nichols. Hey, it's Jordan. And as you can see, we're coming to you from a miraculous beachside location. We're going to talk about that a bit. We've got some really interesting stories for you. So last week, we talked about the Nikon Z8 Lugs. We have an update for that. TT Artisan has a brand new, very stylish lens that we're going to talk about. Bubbles. Bubbles. Uh, you know, if you're at the beachside and you're going to be in the water, do you need a rugged underwater camera like the TG6? We're going to talk about that. Is it dead? We don't know. And on a happier note, camera sales are bouncing back so it should be good we've also got our uh, tech stuff that we're going to talk about our tech support you guys have a lot of great questions and our top story our favorite best travel photo gear setup for when we're doing something like this let's get to it This week's podcast is brought to you once again by OM System. And the OM train. System OM5 <laughs> is the ultimate companion for the outdoor enthusiast. Built to endure your adventures, this mid-range mirrorless camera is a rugged marvel with its weather-sealed body to safeguard against dust, water, <laughs> and extreme temperatures, which ensures unmatched durability. The OM5 offers advanced technology to deliver stunning image quality and exceptional performance in any condition. From breathtaking landscapes to action-packed moments, the OM5 empowers you to embrace your adventurous spirit while preserving the memories of your journey. And uh, I see you just showed it there. You brought one with you today, right? Yeah, we brought the uh, OM System OM5. Nice little travel camera, absolutely. With Eight. the 8 to 25, one of my favorite travel lenses, ultra wide to normal, is the future he likes, of lens design. He likes wide. He's a he's a wido, not a weirdo. He's I, a wido. I do like wide on vacation. Because yeah. look at the beautiful, not green screen beach behind us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, I mean, this week we talked about, are we going to be able to come to you guys from our vacation here and so we're at the lovely shores of lake shushwap you're gonna hear trains in the background you probably already did during that ad read you're gonna hear like seagulls flying around it's going to be interesting but we're making um, it work before we move on from our from our lovely sponsor do you guys have any any particular things you like about the om5 that uh, make it ideal for for traveling if you're especially with just say camping specifically to what right. you guys are doing right now well, you know, I mean, I, I brought my own one, of course, and I love the fact that you don't need a tripod for that. I mean, that's one of the big advantages, but the OM5 brings those same yeah. advantages and it's definitely sexier and it's definitely more compact. So if you want a lot of the benefits the OM1 brings, but you want a, a smaller, lighter package, I think that's what's great about it. Well, the biggest thing for me is this, one of the big upgrades of the OM5 over the EM53 is they added the live ND feature, which I love. So for mm. landscape shooting, yes. water and stuff. We've talked about that in yeah. previous podcasts where you've actually shown off shots you've taken with live and they look fantastic. It looks like you're on a tripod. Yeah, yeah it's great. And you can yeah. pre-visualize, yeah. unlike using a you know camera on a tripod, yeah. you can pre-visualize what the exposure is going to look like while you're hand-holding it. I mean, cool. the key thing to remember is not only does it mimic what ND filters do, right? So mitigating the need of those, but it also is very stable platform to shoot, so you can do it handheld, right? So I mean, that's it's it's kind of a double whammy when you are doing slow. Yeah, hold slow it up. Shot is this shot even worth taking? You can simulate it. It's great. Yeah. Instead of shoot, test, look at the back screen. Well, you can learn more about the OM5 and the highly respected M Zuiko lens series by visiting explore.omsystem.com/petapixel. Uh, all right. So yeah, as you guys can see. Uh, Chris and Jordan are shore side right now. There, I'm, yes. I'm assuming the tents are on the back side of the camera, like from where, like behind where we're seeing you from. You, oh, all the not, camp, you're all not the camping campers, in the water or anything. They're all back there, but yeah, we thought we'd come down. It was raining this morning a little bit, so then we're like, oh, we're under a canopy right now. But uh, yeah, we're getting nice soft light, smoky as always. Hey, Jordan. Yeah, it's been a smoky week, <laughs> but it's beautiful light. So hot spotting to my phone through 5G seems to be working okay. I hope, but do forgive us. I mean, we're sharing, <laughs> we're sharing earbuds, so I'm probably going to pull mine out or Jordan's going to pull his out. We're sharing mic, so God knows how it sounds. But uh, I've got my water wings on. I'm ready for a swim. Just in case he tips back. Yeah, little floaties. Yeah, little floaties. Chris so. doesn't like the water. People don't know that. So we want to have an extra little safety mechanism. Yeah, it's only because I'm a witch. Yeah. And I'll melt. <laughs> I have no follow-up. <laughs> He speaks the truth. Okay, well, on, on that note, let's uh, let's get through our, the, some of the news stories that we want to talk about this week. You mentioned, Chris, in the intro that uh, Nikon 
those uh, Z8 strap lugs, that was a concern, but it appears that Nikon is making good on it. Nikon has officially recognized that there is a problem with those strap lugs on the Z8 camera, and not only that, has managed to isolate the issue to a set of serial numbers. This has only taken them a couple weeks, actually, so yeah. they went from hearing about the problem to addressing it basically as quickly as I would expect. Um, they have promised to affect it uh, to a Sorry, they have promised to repair affected cameras at no cost to the photographer, which is, I think, the right move. Really, the only move sure. you can make here. I mean, right? again, it's it's tough. Hey, it's sad that they have to do this again, but at the same time, they're approaching it the same way. They were like, "Well, let's just be proactive. Let's be upfront about it. Let's get it fixed." So. Let's just hope this is the last of their, their issues. Yeah, and I hope that not too many people took my advice from last week to put a Noct on your camera and, and swing drop it, it around. to test your lugs <laughs> and just like uh, before <laughs> they issued this official announcement, which also said, don't take Jordan's advice. So yeah. uh, that was also very <laughs> responsible of Nikon. At least people could check a serial number line, right? So that you you don't have to do yes. some ridiculous you don't have to like that. just yes. yank on it. Yeah. But if you're outside the serial number, it, feel free to follow Jordan's advice and just lasso things with your and i think you'll be astounded with the durability of your strap lugs <laughs> <laughs> if uh in the link in the description I'll, I'll link to our story which has the uh the link to the actual like page so if you are concerned about this you can check your z8's serial z8's serial number on oh. uh, nikon's website and it will uh, will work that out for you uh of note one of the main questions we got about this is what would happen if you were doing this, your lugs snapped and you damaged the camera because it fell off your neck and like hit the concrete or something or a lens. Um, I'm not sure if Nikon, how Nikon would address a problem yeah. like that. Like how would they know that you aren't trying to take advantage of them? I feel like they'd want to help, but yeah. how they would be able to tell if the damage was yeah. caused by the lugs or not seems like, I challenging feel, legalese to me. I feel like if it's in the serial number range and the lug is pulled out, they'd kind of ha probably have no choice. I, I feel like they would probably make good on it, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not sure because we've, you know, back when we worked at the camera store, we had a repair department and we would see cases like this go either way all the time. So I just wouldn't bank on it. Like it's really at the manufacturer's discretion at that point. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm sure that they obviously still yeah. want to ride yeah. this like momentum of... You know, the camera's selling well. They want to squash any sort of worries and concerns that people might have buying the camera in the future. So I think I think they'd probably make good. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, hopefully they have a the, lot of goodwill right hopefully now. Hopefully the so incidents are pretty minor. Out. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll see. Um, I, I've, I've asked Nikon about it, but as you can imagine, like the, the, the language that they would have to say regarding yeah. like how they would tell the difference <laughs> yeah. is complicated. So yes. Um, all right. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about today, because it, I felt like it was a rather good timing was because uh, last week we talked about like a bunch of, uh, of lens terms that people might not know yes. what they mean. And one of the ones that you guys brought up was soap bubble bokeh. Right. Sorry. Bokeh. Bokeh. Thank or, you. And, or uh, bokeh. The, bokeh. Bokeh. And if you don't know what that looks like, there is a lens that has been developed by TT Artisan. It's a 100 millimeter f 2.8 that specifically has not corrected for this. And it accentuates in yeah. ex instead. It has like way more aperture blades than is typical on a lens. I think it's like 13 or something. So that is an extra round uh, bokeh. Bo bo bokeh. Oh, that was nice. Bokeh. That was good. That was good. Very well done. You're saying Zed, you're saying Bokeh, or you're improving. One of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this really does go back to what we were talking about uh, last week where we talked about um, how Bokeh and the look of it is very subjective, right? And, and it's not that one's necessarily bad or not bad. We've often, as Jordan mentioned last week, like soap bubble Bokeh, we often criticize because it can often lead to very harsh looking backgrounds. It's distracting. It's, it can be distracting, like very frenetic backgrounds, very energetic backgrounds. But at the same time, sometimes it's cool. And, and if you look at the article on Petapixel, it's it's fantastic because you see a lot of great examples of where the soap bubble effect is being used to draw the eye. The specular highlights are specifically being shot so that you get this very dreamy effect. Um, and at the same time, sometimes energetic backgrounds, you know, it... it changes the mood it, it can it can brighten it it can lighten it it can make it more hectic it can make it more more dynamic that could be a good thing yeah it's just a unique look the, my big 
question is there was kind of a famous Schneider lens that was mm. also a 100 f 2.8. And we're seeing a lot of the Chinese manual lens manufacturers just taking old formulas, probably yeah. that the patent doesn't apply anymore, and reissuing it you yeah. know, with their own optics, probably their own coatings and everything like that. Uh, so yeah, I'm very curious because I was surprised when Schneider, they did that big rebrand and relaunched some of their classic formulas, but mm -hmm. that lens was like 1500 American <laughs> as opposed to like TT artists. Oh, yeah. So you could get that cool look without like, you know, paying like premium lens prices oh, yeah. for something that is not a premium optic. I and, mean, that's not a sharp lens. And it's like, you know, a lot before this, like, it's great that they're making these things. I mean, we talked about Petsfall lenses being remade, you know, I mean, lens baby's done some fun stuff, right? Um, before this, you'd have people basically buy like old lenses on eBay, specifically looking for these formulas. You know, like our good friend, Don Komarechka, he would buy these lenses and then he'd have to like machine new mounts and adapt them to fit onto his digital cameras just to get that same effect. So it's nice to have these things built purpose built for that um at the same time they can probably improve things like better flare coatings and stuff because a lot of those old formulas didn't do a great job there but i think as 100 mil it's great for portraits you know if you're doing like city street lights behind somebody or water you know off the like sun off the water or christmas lights like you're gonna get cool shots so fun it's about fun it's yeah. subjective and it's about fun. We did a really cool thing where we put that lens on a motorized slider and had it pan around a rock. And oh, you've got like yeah. the big soap bubbles um, rippling behind it. It was a very cool effect. Very cool, yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's nice to see yeah. more people having access to these kind of interesting. Uh, you got to keep it fun. That's why I got my water wings on. How long are you going to keep those on? I don't know, the whole show. <laughs> What if I fall in? <laughs> Jaren, you tell us it's, if the water wings are making too much you don't, noise. You don't selectively wear water wings. If you're near the water, you got to have them on, right? I mean, you do the same thing with your with your three-year-old, right? No, if it's shallow, we I, can uh, actually let her. You I are a monster. Adult oh, within arm's I can't length. Say, and there is an adult within arm's length. Somebody, I can't somebody say that call I social hear services. the water wings. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Um, all Our right, four so podcast listeners, of water, I would like to, to uh, apologize. Yeah, if you're listening, I'm wearing green baby water wings <laughs> while the uh, train blares off in the back. I can't, I can't hear them, so I'm, I'm fairly sure that you'll be okay. But uh, this is a good segue because speaking of water, have you guys <laughs> actually, I'm sure you have, used any of the lenses, or the, sorry, not lenses, the cameras in the formerly Olympus, now OM oh, yeah. system, uh, Tough TG series? Can yeah. you tell me about your experiences with them? Because it looks like the TG6 is probably being discontinued. Yeah. I miss the whole uh, like underwater camera industry just because it always uh, gave an excuse where I could go fly fishing and Jordan had to film it for our underwater camera reviews. Um, that probably started his disdain for the whole thing yeah uh yeah there, there's a little bit there it's actually funny you bring that up jaren because sitting at home plugged into a, a usb micro plug is a tg6 that i was planning to bring to the beach for this <laughs> uh and that is the classic struggle with those small you have cameras a tg6 there. i do yeah oh. from uh a previous underwater camera review you should check out that was a lot of fun yeah you took it out to Ontario, I believe. Uh, yes. So we still have the camera. For yeah, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. I took it out. Yeah, and I was fishing. It was great. Um, I had a, I had a TG two. I think. I mean, it's been a long time. I had one for fly fishing, obviously, kept in my pocket, and then uh, I have the Nikon underwater camera. I don't remember its name now. Uh, AW one twenty. Oh, that's damn funny. this guy. Yeah. So I had an AW one twenty, and then I let Maddie use it. She, you know, it was a great. Like, even if you're not in the water, it's just a great camera that kids can use because obviously, if they drop it, you don't have lenses extended that are going to smash the barrels on the ground, and you know they are fairly drop resistant, and obviously they spill a drink on it, whatever. So I'm kind of sad to see those go. I'd much rather she drop an AW120 than my smartphone, right? Like, totally. So even though I know everybody's going smartphones now because they are pretty rugged and they are pretty waterproof in most cases. So well, it, it's sad. I mean, so to be clear in the story, like keep in mind, it's not that we're saying the TG6 is discontinued, right? It's just maybe they're stopping production. And I can't imagine these things are flying out the shelves, right, Jaren? So that's that's so this is what it gets kind of hinky because it depends on who you ask what discontinued means. Right. If you were to ask a manufacturer what discontinued means, that means they have sold every single one and there's nothing in any of their warehouses. Right. But that doesn't mean that they aren't making them anymore. If right. they aren't actively manufacturing them on a line, I think that's what most people would think would means discontinued. Right. So anything left on shelves or warehouses is final stock. That's it. There's no more. That's what's happening here. 
As far as I've understood it, they are not actively manufacturing these anymore, but there are still lots of them available. They're still plentiful right. in the United States. You can't buy them directly from the manufacturer in Japan anymore. That's where this story really started. I but see. it's slowly being discontinued across all markets. Once they're sold, they're sold. But if you were paying attention, not a few weeks ago, uh, OM System released a autoclavable housing specifically for mm-hmm. this camera. For those who don't know what autoclaving is, it's a medical way to absolutely 100% sanitize something. It is a, like a pressurized steam bath for yeah. medical equipment that if it's not made of a certain material, it just like either melts or disintegrates when it's in there. Uh, OM system made one that is autoclavable and it's for this camera. So I don't think it is likely that we're done with the TG series. They would not just make a very expensive housing for one of these and then stop making the camera. Right. I believe that they are just going to use the same body design because they already did that between the TG five and the TG six. Yeah. It's the same exact body and button layout. Uh, they're just going to make a TG7 now. There'll be a new version, and it will probably carry the OM system branding. Right. It might not even be that different than the TG6. It might be the thing that we've seen from OM and Olympus before where a camera is very, very similar so, yeah. to one that was previously branded Olympus. So that's my guess. That's what I, I mean, think is going to I mean, Nikon's canceled their line, I think. I don't they know. They just haven't released one yeah. in a while. And I really, of all of them, Pentax, all the uh, underwater lines, if there's one that keeps going, I think the Tough makes the most sense because it's right. the only one with a reasonably fast lens. Like even the yeah. uh, Nikon was like a 3.5 to 6.3 or something like that, where, you know, the TG starts at an F2, yeah. which is a huge advantage and actually means it. And you actually had like some manual control to shoots it. Raw. It's a sexier body, right? Like a lot of companies want like a plastic body. The, the Olympus TG series is always like a metal body, felt nice. But, you know, do you guys think they're still going to be making cameras like as a whole like all the manufacturers or is the underwater camera market point and shoot we should really say underwater point and shoot market kind of uh you know, i want off? more underwater cameras i Did want ever- them because i think they're cool I, it, it sucks that there's so few options and they don't have the best like sensors yeah. in them i'd like to see something like that you could really take awesome pictures underwater with i don't care if it's but a point like, and shoot if it's a fixed did, lens did you ever play with an aw1 jaron this is like an unknown yeah, that's no. camera that <laughs> rocked that was like the nikon nikonos no. rebrand almost yeah it they was, made uh, an underwater interchangeable lens camera only ever made two lenses for yeah. it um it, it was, was cool like, it was a great camera yeah. i brought it to the pool like three years uh for christmas my family would go like to water slides in a hotel and we took that and it was fantastic because yeah. it was reasonable in low light that sensor was really fast it how used old the, is it it used uh, the slightly larger series one right like the one series nikon one type series one sensor, uh, type yeah. one sensor and uh that's we're talking like 10 years old nine years old gotta be at this it was point. a long time it was cool but you know what it it didn't take we gotta off. get one it didn't take off like oh, i would love if someone has one. I would love to do a re-review of like the camera series that should have taken off. Oh, we should totally do an underwater shootout, re-review, and then I can go fishing somewhere. Ugh. Yeah. Vetoed. (laughs) Never mind. I'll take it to the water. Um, Okay. Well... (laughs) But, you know, while we talk about the... uh, Yeah, while we talk about... so good. Uh, (laughs) Speaking of... While we talk about the industry, like, (laughs) dying in the underwater market, there's another industry which is coming back, right, Jaren? It's yeah, it's, it's all, all cameras. It's all, all cameras. Uh, well, <laughs> no, not all. Not underwater interchangeable. Cameras. Yeah, <laughs> specifically interchangeable lens cameras are doing well again, uh, according to sales numbers out of Japan, out of SIPA, the same com- the same group that does like battery testing for mirrorless cameras. Uh, they released their shipping information on like how many. Uh, cameras are being sent out around the world internationally by uh, manufacturers in Japan and numbers are very strong for the third consecutive year after Mm. the onset of the pandemic. uh, The numbers are up. Uh, Sales numbers across the board are high and the number one driving uh, market for this is China. China's sales in the country are up 40% year over year for the same uh, like six month period beginning of the year. So January to June. Um, Japan is up significantly as well. Mm-hmm. Like their, their numbers are up 20%, I believe, or something like that. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me verify that. Uh, Japan was up 30%. I was wrong. That's and then Europe crazy. saw a 9% sales increase. There was, there was no specific information on the U S or Canada, but I imagine numbers are up there as well. Oh, I was just going to say like, 
because we do have family members who work at the camera store and you know we're not hearing like the doom and gloom that we did even just a few years ago yeah, it's true. so yeah i mean that's just one example but it does seem like there's a a nice bump coming we are still a bit away from where we were before the pandemic i looked at some previous numbers and they were shipping monthly about a quarter of a million more units worldwide right. in 2019 bef- than they are now. However, it's much better than it was. Like we were in, in March of 2020, I believe is when we bottomed out and the numbers were horrible. And yeah. so like there were some really bad signs for the entire imaging industry. It was really scary, especially for like us whose, whose jobs and livelihoods are all very based yeah. around the imaging industry. It was a scary time. So it's really, really nice to see that camera sales are bouncing back. Smartphone sales are dipping. People are starting to not need to feel like they need to redo their smartphone every year now. Yeah. And I think finally after some hands-on experience that because a lot of them are in their own bubbles and they don't necessarily watch uh, camera specific YouTube videos or social media or whatever, they are finally realizing that their smartphones are not as good as standalone cameras. I'm talking mainly Gen Z. Yeah. And so now they are actually buying standalone cameras as opposed to relying on their phones. I hope so. Uh, and I think manufacturers of phones are starting to realize this. Yeah. Um, I, I, Samsung's I hope we see last this few releases have, uh, Samsung's last few releases have not been that impressive and the one that they just did this summer their their cameras are like non not different at all than the previous year so it's like they're not putting emphasis there which is strange also compared to China because like Xiaomi and Vivo and a lot of those other brands that are over there are putting like a lot of emphasis on cameras mm-hmm. but then they don't make them available in the west so it's like difficult right. for um, people to get an idea of like where, where are we going with this and also like how do we cover these these smartphones that no one can buy that sort of stuff so it's like they're making good stuff but no one can get it i don't know I, it's, it's a it's a it's a rapidly evolving market i hope we're in a situation where you know it is actually improving and it's not just that covid set the bar then so low that you could pretty much only go up from there mm. Like, uh, we'll see you next year if there's a lot of growth. Can you imagine if you were a camera reviewer that exclusively did underwater point and shoot cameras? Oh, terrible. Yeah. Man, you'd, you'd be out of, out of the game. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think also we keep hearing this kind of hypothesized, and I'd love to hear an actual study about it where a lot of people picked up photography during the pandemic, yeah. like pulled their old camera out of the box again. And now that it's a hobby that they've embraced, they're buying contemporary equipment because there is you know yeah. a real advantage to these modern mirrorless cameras and things like on a that. positive note whenever sepa does put out numbers in real terms it's always much higher so maybe we're like 60 percent uh you know they say 30 we're at 60 maybe they say 40 we're at 70 we'll see we'll see how it goes <laughs> i don't know if this is the same as <laughs> i hope it's exactly That's usually, like battery life. usually ho- <laughs> 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 i don't think i don't think the sales numbers work quite the same oh. way but that's a nice uh nice thing to talk about so before we get to our our main story where you guys are going to basically drive that one. If you wanted to talk about whatever you guys have been doing lately, talk about why, why you guys are out camping. Um, I will say I'll, I'll lead off here. Yes. Uh, big I news. bought a house last week. Congrats. So I'm moving. Uh, I will, my studio will be changing at some point here in the, in the, in the future, but it'll be in the next month or so. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm very yeah. excited. Uh, my wife is actually over there right now. Uh, dealing with some of the stuff that comes with acquiring property. Nicely done. Uh, I spent I spent an entire day this past weekend finding, installing, and like getting all the pieces to replace a doorknob in yep. my house. This so I now know life, the struggles of home ownership. This is the rest of your life. Welcome to being an indentured servant the rest of your life. Well, we're out here. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We're out here camping. Um, don't get a trailer. That's another house that you're going to have to then throw money at uh, constantly. Uh, it as sounds I'm experiencing. like a nightmare. Jordan, I, they, so, you know, we, my wife and I bought a trailer. It's been a nightmare. It was full of mold. We had to like, I was going to just set it on fire. And then we, we were like, we found this guy who's going to fix it for a pretty good price. He did a great job, gutted everything. And so we've been out camping now, but I, I think I talked about this already. So I'm into this trailer now for a lot of money. I had to put new tires on it. I figured out that my spare tire, the one tire on the left side and the other tire on the right side were all three different brands. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds kind of janky. So 
got all new tires. Anyways, it's been wild, but we got the kids out here. We're out here together so that we can do the podcast. It's all the podcast. That's why that we're vacationing. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, we got to keep the podcast. I was like, though. people are tired of our basements. We got to expand yeah. the show. Yeah. And yeah. that's why Jaron's buying a new house. As well. <laughs> <laughs> we're out here in interior BC. We're going to, uh, <laughs> we're going to buy some wine. We're going to do some boating. We're going to do some fishing. We played in the sand. Like it should be good. So, uh, yeah. So and, I, I don't know if this is a global thing, but I'm trying something new this trip. It's called RV easy. So my yeah. wife was like, we're renting an RV for our camping trip and um, immediately like start having night terrors. Cause I don't want to drive a big RV around through like British Columbia winding roads and everything. And she's like weeks later, I'm expressing my, <laughs> my fear. And she's like, no, no, no. This is a thing where they drop the RV off at your campsite, hook it up. So it's like an Airbnb. You just walk in. You hang out in it until you're yeah. done your camping trip, and then they come pick it up after you leave. It's incredible. Uh, so I'm trying that out. It's definitely yeah. more expensive than a standard rental, but my mental health is worth it. And that's yeah. the lesson I want to give to everyone. <laughs> you consider how much I've put into my trailer there already? I think you're, Listen, you're way ahead. You hear that story, yeah. and it's like, yeah, I don't know. I like walked in, and my taps worked, and I had to sleep in a comfy bed. I can't, I can't think of anything worse for you, more stressful for you than having to own a trailer. I think that would no, be like your, be the end 100% of your, your greatest nightmare. If if I committed a crime and they're like, what is the worst punishment we could give Jordan? It would be RV ownership. Yeah, yes, so, like tow a trailer. So this has been great. <laughs> Maintain it, hook it up. And you don't have to clean your poop out. And I got I to gotta do the poopy poop. I and you don't have to do that either. Do any poopy no poop great water cleanup. Either. Very exciting. Man. Uh, so if your country offers this service, uh, thus far, I can hugely recommend it. Yeah, we got a train nearby here, which is great. We're going to, uh, you can hear it. It's going to happen sometimes. It's lovely. Sorry, yeah. That's actually, that's actually a loon. That's actually our uh, loon, the national bird on, on the lake. That's what they sound like. And uh, we're out here in BC. We're going to do some wine drinking. We're going to. Uh, you already said hit, that. Oh, did I? Might have we're going to start We're going to buy some fruit. <laughs> I'm, Very I'm excited having, about I'm, it. No, I'm having a Coke Zero, you know, my favorite vacation drink when I'm vacationing. Coca-Cola, Coke Zero, the best drink you can Not have on vacation. No, Not a, paying for this spot. Oh, can you imagine if Coke is podcast. We'd be delighted. But Jordan is also, look, Jordan's the lush. I saw him put Bailey's in his coffee this morning, and now he has a Clamato Caesar in a can. So don't make me out to be the alcoholic, bro. <laughs> when camping, happy hour starts any hour. Yeah, you don't even own a trailer. I don't know why you're so stressed <laughs> out. You got to get drunk at, at 10 in the morning? Well, this so let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's transition to you guys talking to me about not your beverages and your uh, drinking schedule, but more about the stuff that you guys like to bring with you oh. camera-wise when oh. you're traveling. So let, let, take, take it alcohol. away. Let me know what you guys use because I, I haven't traveled with my camera in a really long time for like a vacation <laughs> or a camping trip. So I wouldn't know where to start right now. So you tell me. We have like totally different requirements. So yes. that's what's kind of nice is, um, yeah, I mean, I'm always doing a, like even on my own time, I'm still shooting video. I like video even after doing this for a really long time really? where you're primarily like photo. So you go first. Yeah. You want me to go for, okay. So uh, not not that our show is sponsored by OM System, but I do often take the Olympus uh, or, or the OM1, right? Like uh, I've got some older Olympus, I got the OM1. And it's it's actually, again, like we talked about, because then I don't have to bring a tripod with me. I don't have to bring filters. So it's kind of that con. And it's small, right? Micro Four Thirds in general. I do like that for travel. Um, I really, we talked about Panasonic bringing back something compact. I used to rock a GM5 for all my travels. And I straight up loved that concept. It right? was like a point and shoot size camera that just. But uh, interchangeable lenses. Like I, I loved it, right? Um, you could use a tripod, but I would take this like tent pole tripod. You just undid it and it would like assemble itself. I mean, that was the nice thing. And so having the live ND it's and called stuff. called the like, zip shot. Oh, so good. Tamarack cool. zip shot. Good luck finding one of those again. I love that. So, you know, that would be my choice in a lot of cases. Um, Sony just released the 20 to 70 F4, which is one of my favorite lenses. And, and I'm saying that because for me with travel, the body, I don't consider as important as the lenses personally, right? If I'm going overseas, I'm not going to have the option to carry a lot of different glass. To me, what ranges I have to be creative with are more important. So that 20 to 70 F4, like, mwah. That would be perfect. I don't even care what body's on the back of it. Like that would be perfect because it gets me that wide angle coverage. It's sharp lens. It's fast enough on full frame. So those would be my two big choices. Yeah. I mean, I'm really fixated on, we've talked about this on previous podcasts. On Clamato Caesars. Is the ultra wide to normal zoom. 
which, yeah. you know, kind of that 20 to 70 you just mentioned falls into that. Um, like, yeah, the 18 You like wide, wide, wide. Yeah. You really so do. like a yeah. 16 to 50 equivalent. And then I just brought, um, I always do a wide angle zoom and then a prime. I want something for low light uh, whenever right. I travel. Um, so, you know, like on the OM, I've got the 8 to 25 and then the 75 one eight, one of my favorite lenses. But, um, you know, looking at like APS-C and things like that, for the Fuji film, I traveled for the longest time with just a um, 18 to 55 millimeter, their kit. Like yes, that really good, good yeah. super small kit lens. And then their 50 millimeter uh, F2. So you've got, you know, just a little bit of a low light advantage there as well. Hmm. Uh, ideally the 90 but I didn't have the money for the night back then. <laughs> it is funny because I, I totally get it. Like I, I totally see the benefit of having primes, having wide aperture, doing shallow depth of field. But it's like we have a different approach because when I go traveling with a camera, I want it to be like as simple as possible. So like a micro four thirds, I would probably go like 18, uh, sorry, the 12 to 100 F4, yeah. just so I could have everything covered in one lens. Maybe then throw like a yeah like a like an 85 mil fast equivalent full frame you know just so i could have that like the 43 1.7 or something but yeah i try to keep things as as like minimalistic as possible when i travel now photography wise but to be fair most of the time when we're traveling it is uh, we were still shooting we got to do work or we're at a press event where we're using whatever they they're, yeah. they're, they're making whatever, us use whatever they have and i think it's just a different mindset because photographers can travel lighter like if yeah. you want to shoot video there's going to be some extra components involved like i do have to bring you know a bag of my filters that i've got right here um you know chris generally doesn't bring a tripod if at all possible i will always have a monopod when i'm yeah. traveling i can only think of a few trips i've done where i don't have that this is the i footage cobra 3 which is yeah, one of the greatest things ever made. Um, I really like to have that for photo and video, right? Yep. I've got, I like doing time lapse and things so I can break this down. I bring a that. tripod traveling, but it sits in the car. Uh, but I, I use the Leo Photo Mr. Q, the LQ284C, and I actually really like it because it's it's fit for my height. It's not fit Jordan for my height. Jordan hates it. Drives it. me crazy. Yeah, I'm it's too short for him. Ring over top. Of yeah, it. but I'm not overcompensating with the size of my tripod. So the Leo Photo Mr. Q is perfect for me. It's got a strange name. It makes me smile every time I say it. So, uh, but I it, honestly, it stays in the car a lot. You know, if if uh, somebody made a Micro Four Thirds rugged underwater camera with like three interchangeable prime lenses, yeah, you'd be that's that's that good. would be cool. Yeah, I mean, I would take that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying, anytime I sh we, we blather this stuff out, some manufacturer ends up making it. So you're all welcome. Give it five years and there's going to be something. It's funny. You just mentioned like the micro four thirds mm. thing. Um, one lens that I found like really changed things up is the Panasonic 12 to 60, two right. to four. Right. Um, Keep talking. Yeah. Okay. Someone else is talking. So we don't need be, a bit. Don't be distracted. Um, okay. Uh, which is a lens, you know, it's a great range, that kind of 24 to 120. The thing I loved about it is the macro is outstanding on it. So a lot of the time, you know, as opposed to going out and doing landscapes or something, have a lot of fun with the macro end of it. Yeah. So uh, those are really good. Uh, the other thing I wanted to shout out that I did once is I don't generally like super zooms. Um, like yeah, because you, you always to have to fight me. You always have to be such a contrarian. No, no, no. I mean, I'd say, because uh, you've mentioned a lot of micro four thirds options, and I think that's one of their big advantages is like a big zoom range, but like really good image quality. Um, the Tamron 20, 35. 28 to 200, 28 to 5.6, oh. I took a trip with. Um, so if you have a full frame camera, uh, I was actually found that perfect. Generally those like super zoom ones are pretty compromised one end or the other. Um, but that's actually a really hmm. good performing lens and it's, you know, two thirds of a stop brighter than those lenses generally are on both lenses. So if you've got a Sony, that's great. I'm really hoping we'll see that for the, um, Z mount as right. well. Now that we're starting to see Tamron full frame lenses for Nikon. Best travel cool. camera, any smartphone. <laughs> that's, that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Just, <laughs> Jaron, the last time you took a trip, like maybe we're going back eight years, what was your kit? <laughs> um, so I actually, when I went down to the Apple event, I would say is the last time that I traveled alone with the idea that I might need something. So I brought two things with me and I feel like I would probably bring them still. I, I shoot Canon and I don't have a bunch of other stuff kicking around. So I brought my R5 and a 24 to 70. I feel like the 24 to 70 would get most of the things that I needed done. Do I want wider sometimes? Yeah. 
but I, I really like the 24 to 70. I like the image quality and I think it's just versatile enough. But as far as like travel stuff goes, this is going to make me sound like a super shill, but like in March, uh, Ulanzi and Photo Pro, they came together and made a tripod together and they sponsored a like a, a first look, like a hands on with it. So it's not a review, but now I can actually talk about my personal opinions about it because this is no longer the sponsored part. I freaking love this thing. What? It's Give a us tiny one. tripod. <laughs> Uh, it, I, I could I could grab it. It's over on the wall over there, but I'll, I'll, I'll I should be showing it right now in the edit what this thing looks like. Um, it packs down as small as the Peak Design one that uh, mm. I liked for a while, but I ended up really hating the head on the Peak Design oh, one. I hate the, the worst you, thing ever. If yeah. you change the head out, it loses a lot of the compacted nature of it. So it wasn't like my I I, I didn't like using it. Um, the the Ulanzi is has a full fluid video oh, head like me. pan tilt whole thing all built into something that's about the size of the the center of my palm and it includes inside of it there's a magnetic slot to hold the uh the, the hex key for screwing in the plate onto the bottom of the camera and then the plate itself is just like a tiny little art like arca swiss smaller or so hmm. size little thing and it still slides in and out and it's extremely secure and then the tripod legs are really neat because they don't clip or twist like traditional ones. You just grab the whole leg, twist it out, and the whole section then unscrews. And then you oh, twist cool. back and they hmm. all lock. So it's all from like a one joint. I don't think that this is going to be particularly good if they get sand in it. But if I don't plan to be someplace super dirty, I don't think that this Ooh. is going to be a problem. And the whole thing is super light. And I could fit it inside like typical standard luggage or on the side of my bag. So this is my favorite travel well, now tripod that we've right now. Experienced podcasting in the sand. This is the only way we're going to podcast from now on, which is unfortunate yeah. because we're in Canada. So that's going to be a lot of frozen beaches through a big chunk of the yeah, year. Yeah, we so. need something that can handle dirty. We like to shoot only in dirty places. In fact, we seek dirty places out. That's our favorite. Get so what, on a shirt. what tripod can get down and dirty? Because I'll tell you, your <laughs> tripod sounds great, but it's no Tamrac zip shot. I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna go on Wish.com. I'm gonna like. I'm gonna go on Alibaba and hopefully they have like like a, a C. Knockoff? No, they've got like they've got like a like a C container with like a thousand Tamarack zip shots for like ten bucks. And I'm gonna buy every single one. And I'm gonna give them to my friends. They're they're the best. Unless you need your camera to be stable, then not so good. <laughs> <laughs> good point, Chris. We got a lot of tech support. We got to get to our tech support. Yeah, we have we have a ton of things. To, to go through. So if you guys uh, are ready to move on, um, I think we can we can go into it. Chris, Let's if you want to start, I'll, you, you've got the questions I'll in front it. of you. I got you can it. read I'm them out and answer right them. here. So Stuart Riley, uh, he says, question for PP professionals, which is exactly what we are. We're PP professionals. Don't like that. Don't want that to stick. His words, I want it to stick. Um, he bought a used Panasonic Lumix DCGX8, which is a great camera. Absolutely classic Panasonic. Um, and it does take great... You're right, Stuart. The photo results are fantastic. In the movie section for 4K, though, not so much. Does the camera use autofocus for 4K 30 and 4K 60 modes? I uh, can't find anything to say in the manual. Any help at all? Yeah, so it's single shot only in those. Yeah. That is the problem with a lot of the early pre-DFD Panasonics um, is, yeah, single shot, lock your focus. If your subject moves, it's not going to track no. them. Uh, so the quality is good. As long as nothing moves <laughs> yourself or your subject. <laughs> Gotta give it the same plane. I really do consider those early Panasonic models manual focus only cameras. Honestly, even the later Panasonic models that, that did autofocus during video, you wouldn't want it. It was, it was, yeah. It they was were notorious for that. Wib jittery. The wibbly wobblies the in wibbly the background wobblies. with that DFD autofocus system. So, no, it's unfortunate. The quality can be very good, but it's yeah. not a continuous autofocus. But Stuart camera. does bring up a good point that, you know, Panasonic needs to make more of these compact, rangefinder style micro four thirds cameras you can go travel with that would autofocus with phase now that they have phased it i mean you could put you the know, 12 to 60 i just mentioned on there and i'm gonna maybe can i be a consultant going. can can a pp professional be a consultant for these companies to actually get get some bank from well, it by, by doing our show essentially we've become unpaid consultants for every camera <laughs> Oh, oh, just offering great opinions of products they should produce. Oh, here we've got uh, we've got an outer space extraterrestrial Xenor nine two six two. He says tech support. 
he or I don't it it's a, a I don't know Xenor recently I've, I've realized I don't know much about how light works in photography and video stuff like stops bits gamma curves etc how should I go about understanding it or maybe I don't need to would understanding it help me resolve some issues that's an that's an interesting two-part question and actually Jaron even pointed this out last time he's like you know we talked about a lot of these lens car- categories uh, which is great but even basic stuff like what does a stop mean right like people might not know what stops mean and stuff so um Let's answer the the last part first. Is it important to understand things like the technical aspects of it? All flare, chromatic aberration, stops, dynamic range, gamma curves. I mean, that's a tough one. I've, I've known some amazingly talented photographers at the camera store, they'd come in and they'd be like, they take beautiful photos. And then they'd be like, I don't like, can you explain aperture to me? I don't even get it. And at first you're like, how is that possible? We always assume that people go the route of learning aperture, shutter speed, ISO, focal range, field of view, depth of field. And actually a lot of artists don't and they just see light and they just they just paint with the camera and they're like, I don't know, these, I've had people like, I just, I put it on this setting and I just hope for the best and it works great. I'm like, how are you making such great photos? Yeah, but I do think like so many of these terms that they brought up specifically are referring to things where you could be running into issues, you know, and knowing the terminology will help you understand what the problem is and get right. support for it. Like you mentioned, like bit depth or something like that. Like, Hey, if you're getting banding and everyone's like, well, your bit depth is too low. You need to know what that means. Understand it. Um, you know, uh, in that example, it's the amount of color information yeah. you have. If you have more, you don't have as many issues like banding. You can shoot flatter profiles. Uh, so I do think it's important. But I mean, yes, certainly I know a lot of people who are not technical that have gotten incredibly far in their career. But if they run into problems, then they're in a situation. I guess it depends how much you want to rely on outside help, which is not a bad thing, right? I mean, yeah, you're very technically minded and stuff, and you know, which is I, great, huge benefit. Yeah, it's yeah, super sexy, really popular part parties. You know, like start talking people about bit depth it. at a party, and people will just gravitate to you. You it's, know what I mean? Oh yeah, gamma curves. Some of the parties. <laughs> Sometimes you start talking about gamma curves, and I can barely control myself. I'm just like, <laughs> just you know, take me now. So it's yeah. It's incredibly sexy. How recently did that happen? Okay, honestly, it's never happened. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know. For the sake of the story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is important to understand these things. I still feel like, essentially, there's far more important things to know. Like, chasing light, looking at color, um, composition, that kind of stuff. I think you can learn more from a art history book on classic painting as far as actually achieving good results but absolutely to some degree you should learn the technical or at least be open-minded to to have somebody explain it to you and help you with that i think it's very important especially in today's world where you do have to understand bit depth do you want to talk about gamma curves i mean do you want to put people to sleep yeah, or do you want it's, to- it's your contrast curves essentially it's a fancy way to say that so it's very similar to like your jpeg color profiles built into sure. cameras is another word for like gamma profiles same thing with all of our video cameras we have different profiles to help control the light in different types of yeah. scenes. That's all it is. Log shooting, where you get the most like, dynamic so range, just, is technically a gamma curve. Just to clarify, so gamma curves, I mean, typically we use gamma curves for video. When we're talking about video, right? So it's like you hear gamma curves and it's terrifying, but it really is just as Jordan says, it's kind of like JPEG profiles, but just for video. And it's based off of lots of TV standards that we used. You know, um, Rec. 709 is, is a common gamma curve, for example, a profile that we often use. The color space, yeah. It's a color space. Yeah. You know, so all these things are, are, yeah, terribly exciting. Yeah. It's just different profiles for it. But you know, I really want to do a part three, like a video. We are going to do that. We're going to talk about that in our podcast. So if you are wondering about these technicalities, we will explain them. Sorry, go ahead. You know, uh, this actually goes well to the next question because uh, Chris Thompson asks, what is the biggest contributor to a camera's look? Everyone praises the Leica look, but what is it that makes it? Could Ooh. I achieve the same or similar results with lens adapters or editing the raw files in a special way? Totally. 
Yeah, it, it is a great question because uh, Leica actually does get famous, but Fuji gets a lot of that too, right? Fuji film, people are always like, oh, I love the JPEGs. And before that was Canon. Um, largely, it does come down to the JPEG shooting because the cameras will apply their own color profiles. The manufacturers have put lots of energy and time into developing the look of their imagery. Not only, not only the different color profiles in a camera like standard and vivid and portrait and landscape, but also just their overall spin and take on how much warmth to put in, what color to put in. Uh, you know, people then go crazy about color science and stuff like that. And then largely these manufacturers are using very similar, or in a lot of cases, the same sensors across the board. So it largely does come down to processing, how they handle low, uh, low light performance, like how they handle noise to some degree. But yeah, color profile is a really big part of the look. And so can you achieve that? Afterwards in post, absolutely you can with your raw files. Can you um, can you use other people's profiles that they've already created in Photoshop to give you their personal look? I mean, absolutely. There's a huge industry for that. So, yeah, it is it is a big part of it. it is really the manufacturers their their bias. The biggest issue that I see is so many people are confusing color profiles right now or the look of the manufacturer with the white balance because yeah. there are certainly companies. I want to do a video about this that have substantially worse auto white balance modes. Subjectively. And a lot of photographers shoot a lot in auto white balance where I don't see it as much because as a video shooter, I'm generally yeah. dialing in a white balance, you know, make sure it looks good and I start rolling. So that can be a lot more of an issue. Like I think a lot of the issues that Sony had with everyone like, oh, Sony color is atrocious. Yeah. Um, we're really down to white balance because the video footage looked quite good to my eyes. And then recently they started putting those enhanced white balance sensors in their cameras uh, where it's detecting the ambient light um, mm -hmm. and offsetting that. And then everyone's like, oh, finally, Sony has cracked the color science. Yeah. Um, they finally have compelling. No, it's just the auto white balance was doing. They a just tweaked job. it. You know, another thing to remember, too, is manufacturers are tweaking their their look all the time. Remember Nikon back in the SLR days? They had an issue with white balance where um, they had a look that everybody loved. And Lewis then, Greenish. yeah, and then they, they went to, it was one SLR, I can't remember exactly the model, but it was one SLR model later. And all of the ardent Nikon users are like, what the hell just happened? Like I'm doing the exact same settings and my photos look quite different color wise. And, and it wasn't a profile thing. It was, yeah, it was a white balance thing, you know? And now, now a lot of companies like Nikon give you multiple choices for your automatic white balance. Where auto you white can, balance warm, auto white balance cool, which yep. I think is a great kind of solution for that. Sure. Um, but it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta guess and test. You gotta try a lot of different stuff. And even when you fall in love with a brand's color profile, look over a look, it could change. Uh, the only thing I would say about Leica is they've probably been the most consistent over the years of having a very similar signature, uh, Fujifilm as well, I'd, I'd say, you know, but yeah, you gotta tweak it. It could change. The manufacturer might change it. Style might change, trends might change. Yeah, and it's also a matter of how much work are you willing to put in in post-processing because, yeah, if you shoot raw, you can absolutely duplicate the look of other camera yeah. companies or things like that. But if a camera company has a look you particularly respond to, and even if you shoot raw, it only takes two or three little curve adjustments to get it where you want, then that's great. That's saving yep. you a whole lot of time. Uh, video as well, you have a lot less flexibility unless you're shooting raw video. Uh, for doing things like, you know, heavy color correction right. and things like that. And that, again, is where, like, yeah, there's some manufacturers like the Panasonic. I really like uh, the Eterna profile, yeah. Sony's s Cinetone, as long as it's underexposed, where I know I can get good results quickly out of that. That's uh, a good point, Jordan. Yeah, because, like, for me, uh, as a photographer, I, I will often change the look of my photo afterwards to sort of what I like by eye anyways. But you make a good point in that, you know, Jordan will often be saying like, oh, I'm frustrated with this profile. Like, I, you know, it's he's like, I don't like using this, this camera system. We're not going to name names or whatever. But like, I don't like using this particular camera system because I struggle getting the look I want out of it. And then he's like, oh, this I love using because I know I can work with it. Whereas for photographers, um, although the similar things apply, it's not as hard to change it afterwards and get it to where you want. So yeah, that's a good point. In video, it might be more, you, it might be more worthwhile being choosy about what profile you, you like in a manufacturer.
Yeah. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate that way. I just dial it down to like, how long does it take me to get the look yeah. I want? And I rank most image quality but that I, way. But I have to listen to him complaining about it. He, and he does. He'll Canon be on like, C-Log3. I'm bitching about it every other week here. Just so. like, yeah. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. Chris, There's some other brands to too. To that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm the one who has to do it. So you have to listen. I to do. Li- and I do listen to it. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're water wing buddies. So. Clink. So I think from here, we're going to move on to uh, never read the comments, in which case this week it's fantastic because I actually didn't have to read most of these. We got a <laughs> lot of speak pipe questions. I People love uh, sent in yeah. their uh, their voice messages to us. If you would like to send us a voice message, there is a link in the description below. If you are listening to us audio only on your favorite podcasting network, uh, the link to speak pipe is also in the podcast audio description. And then on petapixel.com every week we publish a story associated with the podcast. There is a link to speak pipe at the bottom of that as well. So we have four of these today. The first one is from Stefan Curry, and I'm going to play it for you now. So I'm currently a working professional, and I use a Samsung NX1 camera, which, um, as you'll probably know, is basically a dead system at this point. So what I want to know is, do you think that I should basically keep using that system until I literally am no longer able to get professional-level results out of it, or do you think it makes more sense to jump ship sooner than later and switch to another um, manufacturer or brand like now rather than when I'm like absolutely forced to. I feel like before we answer this question, Stephen, Stephen, you have cracked the code if you are still (laughs) successfully using a Samsung (laughs) NX1. Yes, yeah. you are a legend. The only <laughs> other person I know who does it is Max Yuryev from Max Tech. Yeah. Uh, but I think this year he finally threw in the towel with it. Yeah, the answer to your question, Stefan, is is both. Like, yes, you should jump ship and get a system that you can work with now professionally. I think it's about time. But you should also never abandon your Samsung NX1. Or send them up to us so we can re-review them because I love oh. that camera. And I wonder if I would still love it after Dude. all the time that's passed. But the thing is... Whenever you're considering doing that, like look at your work schedule and find a chance where you're going to have a gap to learn a new system. Because speaking from experience, nothing is worse than when I have a job, like say producing a camera review, and I get a completely alien camera system given to me and try to do my Uh. best with it. I mean, the first time I use any brand's equipment is always the worst video I will make with that camera brand. Uh, So yeah, That doesn't apply to me because, you know, Chris Nichols, all camera, like finger on hand. You know, just automatically absorbs all information possible about that unit. Um, yeah. I just, I feel, I just, I like, I like intrinsically connect spiritually with the camera, and it, it just, all of it flows out, just hot air flowing out. Hot air is the key okay. word. All right, photographic yeah, vomit. Hot air is the, the is the real key Anyways, one. Anyways, your the, your <laughs> chance for the NX one. That don't rocks. don't ever sell it. Don't ever get rid of it. Don't put it on eBay unless. Oh, I mean, maybe wait till it's worth like ten grand on <laughs> eBay. <laughs> has that sixteen fifty two to two eight? I don't know. I want that lens in every other. Dude, what a great system. camera system. Oh, so good. That eighty five. Remember the eighty five? It was huge. It was so good. Here's another professional. Well, we're gonna listen to. So uh, yeah, let's check out Logan's uh, speak pipe. Yeah, we'll fire it up. This one is from Logan. So I shoot documentary style wedding videos and I'm a bit of a Panasonic fanboy. Right now I use the G9 and I'm really torn between whether I should stick with micro four thirds or, or go full frame L mount. Um, I know full frame beats micro four thirds in low light. I'm aware of that, but putting that aside, looking at all the other factors, I'm just really torn because I see a lot of pros and cons both ways. So I'm just curious from your guys' perspective for documentary style wedding videos, what what do you think are the pros and cons of micro four thirds versus full frame? Thank you. I mean, I think wedding video is actually one of the most challenging um, formats that's really demanding on your camera because you're doing a lot of low light, a lot of high contrast Mm -hmm. shooting. I mean, he mentioned the low light one, but another huge advantage for me would be having more dynamic range in there. I mean, yeah. if he's a Panasonic shooter, he's working with the um, the regular V-Log L for Micro Four Thirds, which is a pretty narrow dynamic range, where the full V-Log profile you get on the full frame uh, is what we probably should have switched over to now that it's getting bright behind <laughs> us and I'm seeing that we're blowing out. Right uh, it is a huge advantage that way. Um, of course, there is the possibility of getting shallower depth of field as well with a full frame one, but I'm really seeing 
wedding shooters moving away from that aesthetic uh, yeah. over the last few years. I think it was completely overdone and people wound up with movies that looked like Interstellar where <laughs> it's out of focus for half the thing because your depth of field is so shallow. I mean, uh, modern micro four third sensors do a fairly good job in low light nowadays. I mean, but I guess, I guess the other question is the technology, right? I mean, we're going to see a lot of micro four thirds cameras. I, I'm sure we will from Panasonic in the future with the new phase detect hybrid autofocus, which is a nice boon for video work, especially for weddings. If you want to rely Rely on autofocus in a lot of situations. So, you know, I don't know. G9 is up, uh, ready for an update. Yeah. You know, I, GH6 obviously doesn't have the hybrid phase detect. I mean, what so, would you what would you do? Would you get an S5 II right now and just be done with it, or would you? Uh, if you have a bunch of good glass, I immediately thought the GH6 is a nice update yeah. because it has the dual gain sensor that's actually much better at higher yeah. ISOs. A 2000 ISO uh, is where it's at its best. Uh, so that would give you a nice low light bump and a dynamic range bump because you'd move to the yep. full V-Log profile. That said, I mean, as an event shooter, like having autofocus in a pinch can be a really nice thing, especially for like gimbal shots, even if you're great at pulling focus yourself. Currently, it's only available in the S5 II series. And yeah. I mean, we are primarily using the S5 II because in a pinch, it's great to have access to that. Do I miss having the 10 to 25 and 25 to 50 does. every time? All the time. I go anywhere because those are my two favorite lenses and they're only for micro four thirds. Yeah, it sucks. But the benefits of to having the it. full V-log outweigh that. Uh, and if you're in very bright light, you're getting that full um, V-log uh, gamma curve. There's gamma. Yeah. Should uh, Logan wait? Should Logan just kind of like hold on to his micro four thirds, tough it out for another season and see what they come out with? If he can I just don't off, know if they're going to I really come think there's going to be a bunch in the fall. I really, like, yeah? this is camera release season now. It's been a while since Panasonic's put anything out. I could see them being like, here, our whole fleet, you know, move to phase detect autofocus. Yeah. We haven't tweaked much else, but we need to get this line contemporary. I could see them doing that. I don't know if they will. That's don't, what I do. Don't quit on your charge. glass yet, Logan. Don't quit on your glass yet. That's our advice. Matt in London has a question for you all, and it's a quick one. Here we go. Okay, Chris and Jordan, why didn't we get a full review with a scoring for the Pentax K3 Mark III? Yeah. Okay, so we don't do scores. So... This That's true. is referring to the famous DP review situation, I believe. Now, we're not going to speak out of turn on this. We did a preview video of the K33. Yep. So um, we asked for a K33. Yeah. They did not send us one in a timely manner. So we wound a up. Three, with, three. Yeah, the cult of K33. Because, you know, Pentex Rico users are somewhat cultish in a good way. Great. One of them just left us a voicemail and they're never going to do it again. No, but also they're great. No, they're wonderful. I, we love, I love alienate our, I know, but it's like a funny joke because everybody thinks we're like so hard on Rico Pentax, but we're actually one of their our most ardent supporters. Anyways, we, we reviewed the K33 great camera, but as a preview, it wasn't full production and we never got around to doing a full review. Cause you know, we got laid off and everything. Well, no, what, so here's <laughs> what happened. When we did a full review, we would do it once we had lab tests yes. and results. When we worked with DP Review, we were waiting on those. The person in charge of handling the review left the company halfway through. Yeah. And halfway through the review. Yeah. Halfway through the review and left a bunch of files and with notes. no context yeah. that nobody knew how to decipher there. Uh, around that time, things got very wonky at DP <laughs> Review, as you may yeah. have heard. And people were like, well, I'm not going to finish this unfinished review. We're getting shut down. Now that things are back up and running, who knows? But now we're not with them. So we probably will not be relying on that. I would love to go back and do the K33. But more importantly to me, I want to do the K33 monochrome. Yeah. It's something that I'm determined to get my hands on this year. So you will get some Pentax love on that. I Which just is kind of the we'll same. I go back to the color body. Because no. basically what we found in the initial review, like our impressions of everything, are pretty much solid with what we were hearing coming yeah. out of Seattle at the time. It was a pretty complete, yeah, we just wanted to do all the lab tests and stuff, but monochrome, it's going to be exciting. And uh, we do love Pentax Rico. We do them all the time. We actually go out of our way to review them. Kai, would you mind stopping us down a little bit? That's my son. He's going to, he's going to change gonna, exposure. He's going to drop we're us We're pretty down. bright. Let's I'm see I'm thinking two thirds of a stop. Just with your aperture. Yeah. Oh, other way. Uh, yeah. Oh, is that shutter or is that aperture? I think you're on the shutter dial. All right. Well, while, hey, while my face he's is doing back. that, uh, I'm going <laughs> to listen, listen to next fire one. up a question from Wayne Goodman. Here we go. Hi, lads. My name's Wayne. I'm life in the fast Wayne on Instagram. I'm an automotive photographer. But when I'm not shooting cars and I want to just have a chill downtime, 
I just wondered, do you guys have a camera that's sat on a shelf somewhere that you'll pick up? And the internet and the world around it says it's not the best camera out there. Um, for me personally, what I like to do is I've got a little Olympus EM10 Mark II. It's got metal dials on it. It's got a really cool shutter sound. It's got IBIS. It's got 16 megapixel sensor. It's nothing professional about it at all. But for some reason, I just levitate to that camera every time I'm just getting bored of work or my eye just needs retraining for other things. And I'll go out with that camera, I'll shoot. I'm sort of reinvigorated to go and shoot photos. I just wonder if you guys have got a camera like that that's lying around somewhere that you'll never sell, but like I say, it's just not thought of as the best camera in the world. If I had a Samsung NX1, that would be that it. That would be all. Yeah. <laughs> Big time nostalgia. Never sell it. Uh, the X-T3 was that way for me. Like I held yeah. on to that camera a lot longer than uh, my wife and I needed to because we just really enjoyed the shooting experience of it. Um, you know, having the like the hingy, tilty screen as opposed to the fully articulating is kind of nice when you want to just go shoot discreet. You yeah. Know, street photos, family photos, things like that. Uh, now that said, I have, you know, deceived the what this guy's asking for because we did eventually tell that camera. Yes. Uh, so no, we just have cameras rolling in and out of our place so often that, <laughs> um, yeah. it's, a, it's a tough question cause I have a disease and the disease is if uh, I have a piece of equipment lying around and I'm not using it, I start to feel really guilty. I don't know if anybody else has that. And I look at it. It's and called anti hoarders. Yeah. It's starting to collect dust. And I'm like, Oh, somebody could be using this right now and enjoying it. And it's not doing any good here. And so, I uh, I do end up selling. I kind of feel that way about the GM5. I regret selling the Panasonic GM5 because that is a camera which isn't that good. It's kind of a pain to use, but I like I love it and I would use it and I'd go out on the streets and if I had it now, I'd totally be rocking it, but I sold it. I'd say you've brought it up on almost every podcast, which truly shows so that, it's, it's like the X you never got over. Yeah, I'll never sell my Nikon FE, but that's as much because we still want to do analog stuff as well as, you know, it's my first camera. I would never get in a nostalgic value, but... Yeah, I don't know. I still have my first camcorder. We did a video on that back in the DP review days, and I should probably roll that out again. The difference yeah. is when I pulled it out again, I did not enjoy it. That camera is absolute trash, and I'm only holding <laughs> onto it for nostalgia reasons. It sucks. So I think I don't think hold it, on to your own ca old camcorder. I think the key thing is if there's a camera that you've used, for me anyways, if there's a camera that I've used that I would like really enjoyed using the experience of, then I would absolutely hold on to it. Like, um, I, I know it's, uh, I don't own a Fujifilm X100V. I wish I did. I, I never will. You can flip it for like three grand. Right. I'll never own one now. I realize that. But I do remember having a great time with that camera. I think that'd be one of those cameras for me, even though the focal range is stupid. Um, I think if there was a, <laughs> you know, there, there's like the Canon EOS R5. I really enjoy the experience of shooting it. Uh, it is still a very capable camera, absolutely. But I would, I would still certainly enjoy using that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's tough because when you start using a new camera system every week, it's hard to really like fall in love with them and hold on to them. Totally tough. All right. So we're going to do one more question. Okay. Uh, I had, a, I had several more in here. So if you asked us something this week and you didn't hear it, uh, I'm going to bank it and you'll hear, probably hear it in the next coming couple coming couple weeks, man. I can't even talk right now. All right. So the last question from CS Dehan. Hey y'all long time watcher, first time writer. I would love some help with my lens decision. I am a long distance hiker. I have a 350 mile hike coming up. Good Lord. And I am struggling <laughs> with my lens choice. I feel like I have the right one, but would love y'all's thoughts. Like the use of y'all here. I currently carry the goat XT4. And for some reason he says, I know y'all are Canon fanboys. I am sorry. I We're don't not. know where that is coming from because that's just me. I don't know you about just you guys. Anyway, he says he has so the uh, XT4 with the something. Tamron 17 to 70 F 2.8. I shoot both photos and video. I love the wide angle for beautiful landscape shots and excellent pairing and excellent pairing with a decent zoom for the occasional wildlife or out of reach subject. I also love shooting nightscapes and macros of mushrooms and flowers. Do you have another lens you suggest? It only needs to be one lens space is limited in his backpack and it can't be too much of a hefty boy since I hike up to 15 to 20 miles a day and it, <laughs> and it rests on my peak design oh. clip on my shoulder strap. So if it's not the Tamron 17 to 70 F 2.8 on the XT four, do you have a different suggestion for him? First off, 350 miles is not a hike. That's a migration. Um, he's he's moving zip codes. 
uh, I don't know. Like, what's it? What's it? I like the 17 to 70 Tamron. I'm like, that's a great little general purpose lens. Um, I'd, I'd probably go with something a little bit longer, super zoom. But the macro, you kind of lose the macro. Like, yeah. what do you think? The 18 to 150, it's a good lens. Uh, or the 18 to 105? You know, I was thinking about that. The one thing I would say maybe is uh, if you're looking for that standard range, the Sigma 1855 is so incredibly small and light, but very similar to his yeah. Tamron. But if we're just trying to save weight, that was an excellent optic that's just come out for a XF mount. But because it's a Fuji film, and I do this every time someone brings it out, I would also snag yourself a 90 millimeter. It's small, it's light, it's perfect, and it's just long enough that 135. But he said one like, lens. What? He said okay. one lens. Ah, fine. He can okay. only take the man's hiking then 15 to 20 miles a day. I'll save a little weight. I'll give it. You know what? Andy wants a 200 f2, the great white sharp. That was <laughs> yeah. There you go. That'll save you some weight. No, this is the tough thing, right? I mean, seventy is a perfect. I choice. think you're better with a super zoom, to be honest. And again, this is Jordan and I disagreeing. He wants to go prime. I want to go super zoom. Um, yeah, you said wildlife. I mean, you can't shoot wildlife with an eighteen to fifty-five unless it's dead. Yeah, not a lot of good uh, super zooms in the XF. Oh, that's a place for Tamron and Fuji to rush yeah. in there. Do you even have time to take photos when you're hiking fifteen to twenty miles a day? I don't know. I'm curious. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have a great answer. I'm sorry. I think the 1770 is an excellent. I answer. like the 1770. I think you already picked a, a good choice. Yeah. Or go super zoom. All right. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the last one we have time for today. That's a tough uh, one. If uh, you guys have any more, make sure you throw us your questions on YouTube. Send us uh, a speak pipe it's question. Right. Link again is in the description below. Uh, I'm going to let Chris and Jordan get back to their families, maybe use those floaties in the water behind them. The, the, yeah. the weather looks like it's Whoa. getting brighter and clearer. We just have one floaty, though. I've lost my earpiece each now because I didn't want I didn't want Jordan to drown. So I, I've only got one. So we're going to like, it'll be a wrist up floating in the water and then we'll just be below. But that's okay. That's okay. All right. Well, that on that Chris. note, we'll catch you all next week. Thanks for joining us. Wait, if we hold hands, if we hold hands, then we'll both float together. No?